so I don't know if anyone from Brushwood um, remembers this, but about five years ago, the Freemans, who portaged their canoe um, to D.C. from northern Minnesota, actually stopped at Brushwood after this was, they were doing a book tour and also using it as an advocacy platform um, to go back to D.C. after they spent their year in the wild. And again, they were pulling that canoe, <laughs> this time with bikes. So I think they were like, I don't think we can portage that canoe again. It was really impressive, very wild. Um, but you know, I think part of the reason we chose that episode is because it features the Midwest, um, because this is such a special region that people often don't think about for nature, right? right? We think about the expansive West, you know, or we, might think about Appalachia, or we might think about you know Florida's beaches, but we have some pretty pretty incredible nature right here. Lots of outdoor space to explore. So we're going to explore with our wonderful panel a few conversation items, um, and we'll see how much we can get through, and then maybe take a few questions from the audience as well. Um, but we'd like to start out by having our panel just do some introductions, a little background, and in the spirit of this episode that we just saw, share a wild space that is important to you. Celeste, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, Celeste Flores. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a daughter of immigrant parents. I'm a sister. Um, you know, and for me, there's a lot of spaces that I really love, um, particularly water though. Um, I'm really drawn to water. Um, so I'll, I'll do two. So the Waukegan Beach, um, the dunes are just so beautiful. Um, but you know, one of the things and the reason I'm so connected with Brushwood is because of the volunteer work I do with Clean Power Lake County, um, and it started off to retire a coal plant, and I see the coal plant from that beach. Um, so it's just a reminder um, of knowing that there's something else that we can have there. Um, and then the second one, because we're in, the, in Illinois as well, and hopefully some of y'all have been there. If not, I would really recommend going to the Shawnee National Forest. It's about a six hour drive south, um, but it's beautiful and there's waterfalls there. There's also a Shawnee uh, wine trail for those of you interested in Illinois wine. Um, but water, that's really my space that I'm always looking for. Hello, I'm Dewan Lamont Hayes. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. New uh, is just a Chicago land. I'm an artist, um, multidisciplinary artist, focusing in regeneration and um, agriculture, and just connection to place. Um, and if you've never been to the sand hills of Nebraska, mm. the Oglala, the grasslands, mm. um, to the, uh, the Northwest, wow. Um, people call us fiber country. Um, like, oh, it's out there, just, it's flat, just corn. But no, there's, it's one of the, it's, to see the horizon for hundreds of miles or countless distances is one of the greatest things you can ever experience, I think. Um, and, and travel, feeling that expanse going westward. Um, and then I've also formed a really intimate connection with Washington Park on the south side. Um, just been spending a lot of time there, and it's one of my few places I can just like cozy up and, and escape the city, if you will. Good evening, everybody. Um, Adam Carson, um, my wife and I own Driven Culture Coffee Shop in Waukegan, and we also manage uh, Subaru Mercado Gonzalez. Um, you know, a little bit about me, I'm originally from Mississippi, and so my understanding and access to outdoor spaces has changed over the years. Um, I don't know if many of you have been to Mississippi, but you can like drive 10 minutes and you'll be in a farm or in a field somewhere where there's wild animals all over the place. Um, and there's cotton being grown and there's people working the land. And so there's something uniquely beautiful about uh, the expansiveness of Mississippi and its Delta. But right now, my favorite wild place is our backyard. Honestly, we are in Waukegan, um, in the heart of Waukegan. And in our backyard, we managed in the last five, seven years to have a family of raccoons 
um, that moved into our attic when we moved into New York. That was really fun. Um, there's a family of rabbits, um, possums. We have all types of things that are right in our community, right? And so as we have a four-year-old daughter and a daughter on the way, I constantly look at, and something about moving to New York City, you realize how much space you do not need to live, live in, right? Um, but I think about like our footprint of our yard often in life. What do we do that's more responsible with this space as opposed to mm -hmm. particularly like manicuring every inch and corner of our yard? Like how can we turn this into a source of food for us? How can we turn this into a, a, a lab for science? Um, our daughter's at Lake Forest Country Day School and we went to a curriculum night before this and they were talking about like getting outside and understanding how photosynthesis works and how how kids should be questioning like <laughs> what type of soil they have and the types of insects that are in the soil. We've lost our connection to like science and nature and our essence. Um, and that's something that I, I think about and I'll talk more about like the awesomeness of this episode but also the complexity of what it means. Um, to be a person of color accessing space that doesn't feel like it belongs to us, and, but it is sacred and we are so connected to it in many ways. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that. Ooh, travel list. <laughs> Multiple destinations from those introductions. Um, so this summer, Brushwood Center released uh, a health equity and nature report, which some of you have seen. Some of you have been a part of writing, and we thank you for that. <laughs> Um, and so this report really looked at the intersection of those things, health, equity, and nature, in the context of a changing climate in Lake County. And I was really struck in watching this episode and re-watching this episode at the, the many ways that the findings and recommendations that are in this report are mirrored directly in people's experiences in this episode. Um, and especially when it comes to access, right? And you know, there's the, the segment with photographer Dudley Edmondson um, and his incredible birding skills, which were very inspiring, working on it, <laughs> not there. Um, but you know, where they talk about how access is complicated, right? It's not just about proximity, but it's also about so many other components of experience. And like he speaks really directly to the racism that he's experienced in the outdoors, to the inequities that are just inherent with spaces where people occupy, right? And so for our panel, you know, I'm, we want to know, you know, from your perspective, why is it important that we think about access to the outdoors in ways beyond proximity? that extend to creating spaces that are welcoming and that create that sense of freedom. I love how they, you know, describe that. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone want to go first? I'll, I'll go with yeah. um, So, um, my name is Dewan. My photo was, for, was used for uh, the exhibition uh, for Visible at Brushwood. And um, you'll see some of the photos inside of the report as well. Um, and. The, the photo is of my good friend Peyton, who we've, I photographed him in 2020 in um, a side lot next to our house, which is actually a block away from the highway, and um, while we were at home um, during 2020. And we, this particular lot um, had been mowed over for several years and had just been grass. And um, when we moved into it, our landlord also owned that property, so we were like, hey, no more mowing, um, we're just gonna let it grow. And um, when that happened, this rewilding started to take place. And all of these beautiful flowers and birds and insects and, um, and just an ecosystem started to show itself. And um, it was a summer day and we just stepped out and I was like, I wanna get you in the tall grass. I wanna get you with the elderberries and, and these things. And here we are and then like, um, it, if you're not familiar with Omaha, it's a pretty urban city. Um, and so we're in a very old urban part of the town. The highway is right next to us. You know, the main road is there. But if you look at those images, it looks like it's just some pastoral land. And it's because it is. And to your point, of, to the question about access and thinking about that, is that like, like you were talking about, in your own backyard can be that place that we start to form our, reform our connections and our intimacy with. Um, and 
and from there is when I started to learn about how to identify prairie plants because of, oh we just let the prairie grow and this is and this is what it is and invited people to the space and um, planted new fruit trees and did all kinds of things right where we were because it we had the most connection to it and so wherever I go now I, I, I try to you know foster that kind of relationship somehow just by letting it grow and seeing what happens um, this this year in our little plot in front of our garden apartment a bunch of um, you know lemon balm grew and we're like cool <laughs> you know and it was full of pollinators and um, it, and you start to when you just slow down and stop trying to control everything and watch it be is how that access starts to come to you you don't have to force it as much and um, and then it becomes inspiring and you get curious and you want to know more and instead of seeing things that weeds as something that's unwanted instead of something that wants to grow where it is then we can begin to like de develop those connections more intimately and um, once the environment is just itself then people start to talk to you about it and what is that why are you doing that and so uh, in, the, in the case of the lot back in Omaha we since I started growing and letting that lot grow my neighbors got curious and they're like what are you what's going on over here and they've since started their own gardens and I'm no longer there, but they've taken the old garden beds and starting gardens in their backyard because they said, you inspired us all those years ago. Um, so, you know, j just by you digging into your own space and forming connections to it, you never know who's watching and what kind of conversations that can start and the ripple effect it can have. You know, access is so interesting um, for me. There was. Uh, the particular part about his, his comment, um, Bartunde's question, like where are black and brown people in outdoor spaces? Um, so a really funny start to this story, and then it's gonna get depressing, so I'm just giving you guys a heads up. <laughs> so when Nia and I first met, um, I was a consultant working for a, a consulting firm in Chicago, and she was a grad student in Marquette. And I was you know, trying to just get to know her and do cool stuff with her, and so I was like, what would you like to do? And she's like, I really wanna go camping. And I was like, hmm, okay, like, let's, let's do this. So I had just come off a project in Portland, Oregon, and had spent some time outside in Portland. If you've been to Oregon, like, you know it's green and beautiful and just, yeah. like, luscious, right? And so we, I was like, let's go, let's go to, like, the, the base of Mount Hood. Like, it's gorgeous out there, it's green. So we go out there, and, and it was the first of a couple of trips we took out west, right? Now, there's something about growing up in Mississippi and my parents being African-American from Mississippi, there were a couple lessons that they taught me. One was how to interact with police because my father was in the military. My mom and dad always said, show your military ID. I always say, yes, sir, no, sir, because you, wanna, you want them to know that you come from like a good family, right? The other is to be conscious of who you are as a black man in the world and always make sure that you're aware of your surroundings. And my wife will tell you this is something she's learned since we've been married. When we go to rural places especially, more so after 2016, I always look and count the number of people of color that are in those spaces. So I know whether or not I can feel safe or not. And if you think about the complexity of that in space, right? There's no one that owns outside. Yet, in many ways as people of color, there's a permission that we seek Right? There's a comfort that we're looking for in those spaces that is so complicated. Even talking about it is complicated because it's not something that, as an individual, I want to acknowledge in 2023. I don't feel like outside is accessible to me. Right? Mm -hmm. I have to go and check like the, the blogs of places that other black people or brown people have gone to and said, this campground is safe, or this town is safe, or this community is safe. Because you have to have that information and knowledge. right? It's not wise. It's so funny. There's comedians that are talking about it now, but they said if they go to a place and there's too many American flags, that they start to feel unsafe. And I thought if you think about like how crazy that is, right? But there's an association with, especially in rural America, right? Rural America is so much different. The context in which they live, socially, politically, economically, has changed drastically over the last 20 years, and even more so in the last eight years. And so what does it look like if, if so many of these spaces of accessing, right? We're having this conversation about urban 
um, creating urban wild landscape, and then the rural places that we know and love, Yosemite Park, Mount Hood, um, the beaches of Oregon where we've camped also. There are some gorgeous spaces in this country that not everyone feels welcome in, right? You see, and I saw this in New York City, there's like black people go hiking and brown people go hiking. There's all these social groups that have, have been created in which people are going out in numbers because there's safety in numbers, right? But even think about the reality that people have to create affinity groups to then go out and enjoy a space that everyone should have access to. It's a really, really complicated notion. It's a really, really complicated thing to start to break down. And honestly, this is something we talked about at Driven Culture. It's like, you know what, I love camping. I don't want to go camping by myself, but what if we got the whole community of people that enjoy camping that also come to Driven Culture? Like, how do we create an experience where more people feel comfortable going out and doing those types of things? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've gone out in a tent in the middle of the woods. We didn't shower for three days. I mean, this is how we knew we were going to get married. Like, we experienced, <laughs> <laughs> we experienced the, the awesomeness of our nature together <laughs> in the woods of Oregon and made delicious orange muffins in a fire. Yeah. But, um, how do we get people to understand it, number one, their safety in, in numbers, but two, that we all should have access to a space. And even if we have to do that in a group or you know, as a part of a collective, that's okay because we're changing the concept, right? We're changing the people's belief of who should be in spaces. And if those people are coming to a space, everyone should feel comfortable because we all should be interacting with nature together. I think that's something that we have to figure out ways to demystify. And I think, unfortunately, it's up to businesses and nonprofits to create those types of experience that go out into those communities and show people what being in nature should and could feel like. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's so interesting to define feeling welcome or safe. Um, I've always loved being outdoors, um, and I've always felt very comfortable being by myself and exploring by myself. Um, and then I learned about going out with people in my previous jobs, and it was comforting, and it was also probably because it was after 2016, um, which I hadn't even thought about. But in, in 2018, I learned about ethylene oxide, um, which is a colorless, oralist class one carcinogen that causes cancer, and learned that I lived pretty close to two facilities that were emitting ethylene oxide, ETO, and that's when I, and it was, you know, I didn't feel safe, like, because I would walk around my neighborhood or go to Greenbelt Cultural Center, because that's the closest forest reserve to where I live. And I stopped, like, going. I started looking to see what forest reserve I was walking to and the distance to those facilities. Um, so it's just like, how do we define safety? How do we define feeling welcome? Because a beautiful space but I'm like I could drive a couple more minutes and be further away and it, it's not guaranteed right the wind everything all these other factors that play into it um, but it really made me reconsider like do I go by myself to places do I go with other people now um, and it does feel more comfortable going <laughs> with other people or with my partner um, and when we've traveled the same thing like we were just in Wisconsin, and I was like, do we count how many people of color we see this weekend? Um, <laughs> and it's just, you know, I think it's so important when we're talking to people, when we're trying to get people to go outdoors, to know what their comfortable level is, what their definition is, right? So that we can create that space. And I know that's something that Brushwood is trying to do. That's something that Mano was doing before the pandemic, having walks um, with the doctors, right? And bringing these connections of the importance of health, the importance of being outside, and getting people to feel comfortable in those spaces and build community. Well, that was a great segue <laughs> to the next question. Um, but also just beautiful reflections from each of you, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I have an American flag story for you later, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the UP. I grew up in a town of 300 people. Um, I, yeah, it all resonates. Rural landscapes are really different places. And 
you know, what safety means varies so much based on individual identity and experience. And there's so much that we can do to change that too. Uh, which leads to our next topic. Uh, one of the major themes that also came through in our report and that you see reflected in different components in this segment is this theme of community, the power of community. Um, I'm wearing my, it's kind of hidden by my jacket, but my water is sacred, no pipelines t-shirt from um, a couple years ago when we honored Winona LaDuke through the Smith Nature Symposium who was leading efforts to stop the Line 3 pipeline going through northern Minnesota um, that sadly did end up going through northern Minnesota. Um, but what you saw in that effort was a lot of community coming together, you know, like the importance of community, of people being together to be able to fight for change and on behalf of the environment, but also on behalf of each other and to create, you know, healing spaces for each other. So to our panel, you know, how have each of you experienced the power of community um, in these healing processes, you know, in your own experiences? I'll take that one first. Uh, it's something that I, I, I love about um, being inside of Sucumacabo Gonzalez now with my wife. Um, one of the notions, and I kind of I mentioned this in conversations with Brushwood and some of the other conversations we had around health, around the Mexican American community specifically, um, but I, there's also an observation I made about being from the South and growing up in a community that gardened, right? Like we think of like garden, like yes, you got like a tomato plant in a container in your backyard, like no, I mean you're whole backyard is like a field of fruit that you're growing. One of the most beautiful things about um, Gonzalez is that we have people who are Mexican immigrants who bring seeds from Mexico of tomatillos, of tomatoes, of chilies, of corn, all types of things that they're growing in their yards. There's one gentleman like for about a month and a half, he brought us pumpkin flowers and I said to him one day, I'm gonna go to your house because I would imagine that your whole yard is like just <laughs> pumpkin vines everywhere. But what we have created is once we started talking about like growing vegetables, growing, having access to things that were grown locally, people started showing up in droves with things that they had grown in their yards that they wanted to sell to us because they wanted to make sure it got out into the community. Everything for fresh mint, which if you ever plant mint in your yard, be careful, it will take over. Um, pumpkins, which I created a pumpkin farm in our backyard just by doing something I learned in Mississippi, we just leaving there and letting them rot. Yep. <laughs> and they come back. <laughs> and they come back, it's really cool. Um, to epazote, which is another herb that's used in Mexican cuisine uh, for people that have diabetes. Um, to anything you can think of, tomatoes, chilies, all sorts of things. I think that has been one of the most rewarding things to see. And if you drive in different parts of North Chicago and Joaquin, you'll see people have like taken plots of land um, on 10th and Jack, 10th, 10th Street and Jackson, in between Jackson um, and Lewis. People have just taken plots of land and planted corn just in public spaces, right? And so there's, no, there's this notion that, and we're, we're seeing it, right? that if you empower people to participate in community, if you empower people to go back to those traditions that they grew up in in Mexico or in Mississippi or in the South or wherever you're from, like there's so many traditions that are centered around nature, that are centered around health, that we've lost over time because of technology or for whatever reason, we're too busy now, we don't have time to be outside, it's not safe to be outside, whatever, right? Um, how do we support and encourage that, right? The guy that was bringing me pumpkin flowers, everything was fine and wonderful. We had a great thing going, and then he raised the price on me. And I was like, wait, you can't raise the price on me. <laughs> so market forces ruined our relationship. But the, 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 the point of the story is, right, people know how, right, to be in nature, know how to, how to grow fruits and vegetables like we saw in the early part of that episode. Just need to be empowered to do more of that. We need to really open our eyes in communities of color to see like these things are happening. So how do we create the policy system and environmental change that allow people to do more of it, right? Allow those farm stands that pop up throughout the community and power that local church that's growing the garden. Um, just to make sure people have access to the tools and resources they need to do things on a larger scale and hopefully we see the improvements in their health and mental health as well. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's always comes back to family. I mean, now that, you know, um, we don't get us together as much, but 
growing up, it was just going to the state beach and just everyone bringing something, right? And just having a potluck and being in nature, being, you know, swimming in the lake and just coming together. I think, you know, that's where I've really found my community. And then just all, I mean, so both of my parents are from Mexico, I'm Mexican, and all of the quinceañeras, all the baptisms, like all of the holidays, um, the summer, right? Um, there's just always somewhere to go um, and somewhere to be with. And, you know, I think something that I've seen through the work at Mano is our community garden. Um, it's bringing people back, right? People that used to, that migrated here, that maybe farmed back home and stopped because they came here and, you know, the hustle and the work um, and not having that space to farm and now they have that space and they build community and sometimes they're grumpy with each other and upset about who got the plot this year, right? <laughs> and who's watering or, you know, other things like that. But, you know, hearing their stories, especially last summer when we were interviewing them to document um, the history and just seeing that they were going back to what they were doing and something that, you know, when you come here, um, you're told not to do. You're told you're supposed to go to the grocery store and buy fruit. Um, you're supposed to buy your vegetables. And I know when I was in the environmental field, that was one of my, for my parents, they were like, we left. <laughs> we, we were not, uh, they, they did uh, flowers, um, but they left that, right? They're like, we're not farmers. <laughs> um, we came here, you're supposed to be working in front of a laptop. Um, they didn't understand why I wanted to be back in nature, so to see older adults that have migrated here and that are finding that back and building that community, that's just been so wonderful to witness. Um, this year I've done a lot of traveling, um, visiting friends in different parts of the country who are all working in either agriculture or permaculture or some type of land re relationship and um, have been photographing that process and, um, and curating that and bringing all these things together to show that the community is broad, it's dynamic, um, and the future that we're waiting for is happening as we speak. You know, there's a lot of young people, I've just turned 29, there's a lot of folks my age and younger who are like, we're done with all of this. We, we are, we'll never be able for a house. We're saddled with all the debt of this system that was made up. We want to be outside. We want to enjoy soil. We want to have actual food. We want to have actual health. We want to live to be old. Um, we would love to do that one day. And it's not promised. And no one can promise that to us but ourselves. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are, are stepping out, out of the systems that we've been given and inherited and realizing that this isn't for us. And it wasn't really for our parents or their parents, but we kind of just went along with it for survival. And frankly, our survival is built upon us having a real relationship with the land. And um, and so, you know, the really exciting part is that through art and through, we can create community and really sh show each other that we're all doing this together. Because if you go to, say, the South Side of Asheville, North Carolina, and go to the South Side Community Farm where um, you'll find Chloe just working in the in this field that was once um, it's the the school used to be the one black school in Asheville and um, during segregation and um, then it was an abandoned playground now it's a community farm mm -hmm. um, and they give away food in a community fridge and they have um, you know uh, a black and brown vendor markets on the first Sunday that's one community, one place, one holdout of folks being like, we are here and we're going to stay here because the population of black folks in Asheville has decreased by 20% in the last 15 years. So, you know, that's just an example of how people are responding. And so when I show Chloe who what's happening in Gainesville, what's happening here in Chicago and what's happening in, in Floyd, Virginia, she goes, oh, I'm not alone in this. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm taking it upon myself to be like, well, we have to connect each other because there are, there are local municipalities and groups who are all doing this little bit of work somewhere and we're trying to make that wedge and, and but by being a part of the Health Equity Nature Report and to be able to go to other places and say, hey, this kind of report exists. 
and here's the metrics that they're using, here's how they're measuring. We need a, we need a health equity nature report in Nebraska or Florida or wherever we are. Maybe it can make it its way all the way to the USDA and um, into the United States where we're talking about health equity nature on a global and national scale. Then that way, that is that's starting to inform our farm bill policies and our budgets and these types of things. So when we start to connect groups um, and just say, hey, this information exists, I'm not sure exactly what to do with it, but we need to do something, then it starts to really materialize and, and, and galvanize and show that, you know, this room right here, everyone in this room is a part of that change. Um, it's not foregone, it's not lost, it's not we throw our hands up in the air, we just gotta go to work again. Like, guys, we're really a part of this. And so if there's something in your life or someone or a place that you feel like you can connect or injure to someone to or, you know, or protect, please do. Um, because we need all, all of us to be a part of that. And this is a community and we're all a part of larger communities outside of this place. Thank you for that. Wow, I mean, I think that you know, this theme of growing food in community, of creating art in community, but also thinking about community at different scales, you know, at the neighborhood level, at the regional level, at the national level, there's so many different ways to create community, and those relationships are really vital. Um, and I think, Duan, also your point that there is, there is so much amazing work that is happening out there. Like, it is, it is super exciting. It's not getting the limelight that it should. Um, and I think it's something we, we just all need to continue to really look for, shine that light on, and be a part of. Um, because there's some amazing efforts happening, like what every one of you up here are doing is incredible. Um, and so that leads us to our final question <laughs> of the evening. Um, you know, the episode kind of concludes with this call to action for all of us to, to be a part of this change, to help nature, um, the outdoors, but also to help each other adapt to a changing future, a changing climate. Um, and Baratunde has this really great quote. He says, we owe that to the earth which is the same as saying we owe that to ourselves, which I think is just this beautiful interconnected way of thinking about this. Um, how can folks here today in their communities, you know, engage in this work? What advice do you have? That is so tough, right? And it's tough, and I, I think the way that we think about this, we have a neighbor you know, I think a part of the reason why we have a zoo, a small version of a, a nature preserve <laughs> zoo in our backyard is because our neighbor like has let his yard go to nature. So he has milkweed, he has all the, these native plants there. And at first we were like, what the hell? Like he should cut his grass. <laughs> but then we realized so many monarch butterflies were in our yard and we had all these dragonflies and all these, there's just a natural, it's so strange, but it's, it's just this very natural landscape of animals, plants, and insects um, that has emerged as a result of that. Um, and it has really made us rethink the space, right? I would love to put in raised beds and like, you know, just go ahead and like hippie our yard out. Um, and I think it really begins with the built environment that you have control over to begin to rethink that, right? Rethink our, our footprint, our individual footprint. Like we know global warming and some of the larger scale things that are happening are a result of corporations polluting like our waterways, right, and our air and everything. Um, but I think it starts with making those small changes in your home, right, in your yard, and then becoming involved in organizations like Clean Power, like Clean, like Brushwood Center, where you can start to learn and read the things like the Health and Nature uh, Report, where you can start to understand like po local policy system and environmental change that you be can become a part of and understand how local policy, in my heart, like we can launch and change things at a local level and that influences state policy, which then allows us to scale up interventions on a larger scale and hopefully influences um, federal policy. I think we're connected enough here in Lake County where we can start to make these, these small changes and then start to influence policy in a way that makes a ton of sense. But also, as they said in the film, gets people to think about like, what does this change look like in my environment? 
Like Lake County is very different from Nebraska, is very different from Portland, very, is very different from Mississippi. But in all of those, we have climate change impacts that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis for this flooding in New Orleans, right? Mm -hmm. Someone said like New Orleans was not gonna exist in seven years, and I was like, wow, that is really soon. <laughs> so like, what? how do we start to think about localized initiatives and that local obviously begins in our own homes and our own lives and in our own thinking like how are we making those small changes and then getting involved and hopefully and hopefully influencing things on a larger scale down the road um buckminster fuller um is is known as the godfather of the, of the geodesic dome he's also an mathematician and aligned with many other things uh, but a quote of his is um there's no use in fighting the models and systems before us, it's best to build a model that renders the old one obsolete. And I when I just was writing that last night and was reflecting on it and being like, hmm, what did that mean? Like how do you everything like capitalism, ah, you know, like, but when you slow down you're like, wait. Uh, it can start it can start with just like sunflowers on the dining room table. It can start by just going to your farmer's market and talking to the producer and asking them how you can help them beyond just buying their produce. Can you visit the farm? Can you learn from them? But like connecting those dots with people who are already doing it. Um, and then, you know, like who, what realm of influence do you have? All of us have influence on something. You know, it's like, well, there's they are so rich. I'm, we were just talking to my roommate about this the other night. It's like, who's they? We talk about them, like some other people and some some phantom hand. And yes, it's true in some ways if we lend power to it. Um, but it's up to us to decide that we have power as well, and then to utilize and wield that power in a way that is connective and that is restorative, that is regenerative, that is healing, and that is not exploitative and extractive and destructive like we have seen thus far. It's a choice to use your power differently. It's a choice to connect with people. It's a choice to either allow it to be or to do something actively. And, you know, when we recognize that the power starts in our individual person and we start to embody that, then it ripples out in a way in, in our communities, in our friendships, in our language, how we carry ourselves, the, the, the things that we choose to buy with the dollars that still exist. Um, and that's when the culture starts to shift, because I think that's really important. You know, there's objects and there's materials and there's things we can build and there's things we can grow, but then there's the culture that we manifest when we look at each other in the eye and we say, this is something that I care about. Will you join me? Um, how can I help you? Because that's the culture shift that's necessary in order for us to truly put the abundant resources that we have to address the, the, the challenges that we face right now. And so, yeah, you may not have millions of this or billions of that, but you have one you and that is one of the most powerful th tools in our toolbox. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's deciding what your self-interest is and what you're interested in learning more about. I think self-interest gets a negative connotation, and for me, it's I want to get to learn people and what motivates them and what's going to get them to show up to my event, right? So how do we partner? And, you know, I always say, and my partner gets mad, I say there's no, um, especially in politics, no permanent friends or permanent enemies, but shared interest um, and, and a project. And I think, you know, thank you all for being here, right? It's a Thursday night. Um, so you guys are already probably involved in doing things. Um, and if you're, you know, depending on what you want to do, you know, talking to your family, talking to your friends, to your coworkers, to your neighbors, and doing that research about the issue that you care about and the issue you want to put your little mustard seed, right, your granito de arena, your little <laughs> sand um, towards, right, because we have to do this together. I would love to, you know, just 
destroy everything and start over. But really, I would not want to be part of that new society, like, because that just seems really daunting. But there's so much already going on, especially in Lake County, like it's already been mentioned. And I think once you learn about one issue, you realize all these other issues that are connected. And I think that's something that makes Brushwood so special um, and all these other organizations that really people are moving towards not working in these silos and how do we connect health, equity, and environments and for y'all to get involved and you know if you start something and decide that's not what you want right like looking for something else and deciding where you want to focus your time because at the end of the day it's your time that you're giving to something that's the most right people can say you know there's who has the money and everything else but people coming together really can make that change you know when i moved back from you know undergrad and doing americorps if that purse if i would have been told in 2013 2014 um everything that i would be doing now i wouldn't have believed it right i don't think we sometimes are capable of dreaming the things that are coming before us. Um, I would have never believed anyone to tell me that I would be being the guest of the State Senator Tammy Duckworth for the guest of the union and being able to claim that I've had dinner with 100 senators, right? Um, just allow yourself to be uncomfortable and continue in that journey because um, you don't know where it'll take you, but know your why. Know why you're doing stuff because it can get really exhausting um, because things rarely change instantly, but they will. Um, and you're that person that's helping bring that along and knowing your why is gonna help remind you why you're giving up maybe that time to be with your family or why you're dragging your family <laughs> to an event. Um, and for me, at the end of the day, it's that. It comes down to ensuring that my family feels heard and empowered especially when it comes to your local elections. And, you know, in this last election, I was calling my family being like, are you voting? And my godmother was like, will you go with me? And I was like, absolutely, I will pick you up. Um, and that's what, at the end of the day, that's for me why I keep doing this, because I've seen that change in that high school student that now can go and present, um, or even with my family and knowing that if I call them, they're gonna vote. But if I don't call them, they're not. And I'm like, okay, well, I gotta figure that one out. <laughs> um, but you know, just keep doing what y'all are doing. And you know, if you have more time, give it to organizations that are looking for that. Mm. How about this panel? Amazing. Gratitude. Such, such great suggestions, great advice. Um, also, if you want to continue the conversation tonight because we, we are out of time, so we're gonna have to wrap up this evening. Um, but we are hosting a Dripping Culture gathering at Brushwood this Saturday. Um, and hold on, because I was just at Brushwood. <laughs> you can pick up some bracelets. And what else is there? Oh, they're um, uh, the croc. Uh, what are they called? Gibbets. They call yeah. Yes, the, yes. Yeah. Crop uh, charms. That, yeah, <laughs> the crop charms. That is this really sweet fundraiser um, that uh, these two amazing young ladies are doing as a part of their mitzvah project with Brushwood Center. And they have positive messages, and they're, I bought one for my daughter a couple weeks ago. They're so great. Um, and they're raising funds to support both Brushwood Center and the LGBTQ Center of Lake County. It's really wonderful. Um, so we uh, will be hosting uh, when you come to Brushwood on Saturday <laughs> for the Drip and Culture <laughs> conversation with Adam um, and then also with North Chicago think tank, Frank Pettis. Um, you can also buy a bracelet modeled here nicely by Celeste. And then we also invite you all to join us on Friday, September 29th for our Smith Nature Symposium Awards Dinner, where we'll be honoring Baratunde Thurston. 
I'm very excited to welcome him and show him everything, you know, that's, you know, this whole exhibition at Brushwood Center that we just opened that's inspired by his work um, and, and really help him get to know Lake County a little bit as well in this amazing community. So if you haven't, on your way out, if you haven't um, received one of these reports, we do have some extras available. Um, so please take one. They're also available online um, in English and Spanish. And we hope that you'll be a part of creating this change and, and em embodying what the future can be for all of us. Thank you so much. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, do you want to, yeah, there's not tape on that one. You guys want to put tape on that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love photos. Do you need a favor? Uh, oh, yeah, angle to get, capture the, the little bit of light we do have. We can also go out, actually, you want to go Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go outside. Let's do that. Let's oh, yeah, we get the natural light. <laughs> <laughs> the natural hall light. <laughs> Cinema light. <laughs>